Okay, let, let's get started here. Let's get going. It's my extreme pleasure to introduce Diana Wall to you. She's an old friend uh, and colleague. We've known each other for a number of years. Um, she got her start in nematology at UC Riverside and has now ascended to a t become a towering figure in ecosystem, uh, ecosystem function of soils. She works at all latitudes, has published prodigiously, is highly cited, and were you to Google ecosystem function soils, her name would just come up. She's one of three, I would say, three people of similar stature in, the, stature in the world, and one of the other ones she trained. And the, the other one's a Brit, so we don't have to pay much attention to it. <laughs> okay. um, I, I have worked with, with soils and nematology, and she used to come out to the Bodega Marine Lab and teach me how to do things. She, she's a wonderful uh, teacher, uh, very patient, and along with the people in nematology here, I was able to do a whole bunch of stuff, mainly with her and their leadership. She also has an, another career in anhydrobiosis of soil organisms, and uh, is cited in five or six peripheral areas. Uh, oh my gosh, I, I almost forgot. For those of you who are obsessive, you, you, if you want to, I, this is something you have to read. This is her blog. It's called NEMA blog at wordpress.com. And it, it's this wonderful day-by-day, uh, uh, day, month by month, year-by-year year account of, of her laboratory's work in Antarctica. And I'll finish up by saying that Chris, she's getting ready to go back down for high summer um, on the ice, but she doesn't really work on the ice. She works in dry valleys, the non-ice part of Antarctica. So it's, it's a bit of an, um, it's a, a, a non sequitur there. But each year I get um, one of these wonderful Christmas cards from Antarctica from Diana's uh, Diana's lab, and it's called the Worm Herder's Digest. <laughs> and so we're going to hear a lot about that today um, from Diana Wall. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. It's a real honor to be here. I was absolutely stunned when I got the email and said, wow, this is such an honor. I've gotten to come. And I'm had so much fun talking to so many people who I've, some of whom I've known over the years, some of whose work I admire very much and I haven't gotten to talk to. So it's a real privilege and I thank you for being here. As you can tell, I've called this Lessons from an Antarctic Desert and um, documenting climate change. And then there's soil life, so it's kind of hard to do all of this. And I think the way I'm going to do it is kind of step back from Antarctica and give you some information first on both uh, how to look at how we look at climate change or how I'm looking at climate change. It isn't the best way necessarily. And then uh, just a little bit more about the background of why I got into this. And then I'm going to tell you about working in Antarctica and hopefully what we've learned. And maybe you'll agree, but maybe you'll have some feedback that will make our next season a lot better. I, so in stepping back on this, I want to look at what do we need to know to determine the effects of climate change anywhere, whether it's on the ice or the Arctic or wherever. And it's, first of all, a big, a big stumbling block. We need to understand the current distribution of native species. Well, right off the bat, if you work with nematodes like I do that are extremely speciose, in your hand you can hold lots of species of soil. Uh, in soil, that's, that's really a, almost a not starter. And then if you want to work at the species level and say who is it, 
It's a lot easier to do it with a plant species than it may be below ground. Where does it live and why is it in a particular soil or are, are they everywhere kind of a question. How does it respond to its environment? How is it going to adapt to climate change? Is it going to move through the soil? Is it going to be blown? Is it going to be carried in water? And then what do they do in the ecosystem? This is the question I get the most. It may be okay for me to talk about birds or something else, but a lot of people will say, well, so what? What do they do in the ecosystem? So that's been kind of what I look at, and then I try to bring it back to uh, the scenarios and predictions. And again, this is hard doing this in soil, uh, particularly when you work with a lot of above ground ecologists, they will pretty well overwhelm you when they start talking about what they know. So I get intimidated. But I think it's timely because soils are increasingly recognized as sustaining that biodiversity. And they also provide many benefits, which people here quantify, and it's a new area of study, such as being linked to above and below ground. They also are food for wildlife and natural systems. Uh, soil fertility is a big issue. We also know about soil organisms, e ecosystem engineers, the earthworms, termites working and forming soils. They regulate the rate of carbon store. They are important in nutrient cycling. In natural soils, they can be biocontrol. But I think even more than these services, one of the things that is happening is soils are being affected worldwide, and they are the center of a lot of international policy agendas. So food security, obviously, is big. Soils, fertility. But biodiversity of soils, can species be lost and you see a change in function? What do you know about that below ground? That's a question. What about carbon storage, climate change? That's a big issue. So then we go to desertification and how many acres of soils are being lost per day. It's astounding. Check the websites. And all of this centers around soil. And because of these international policies, they have formed a global soil partnership that kind of brings the people from each one of these areas, FAO and uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Framework Convention on Climate Change and Desertification, and they're now meeting to see if they can share information. And as part of that, the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative started a couple of years ago. When we look at soil, I'm not just talking about nematodes, I'm talking about the interactions that go on in total soil. It's, it's enormous group of phyla below ground. And it's not only that, it's the number of species. And this is just a, you know, I just picked something, 10 million species, um, that's probably changed. And then when we look at animals even, which we don't think a lot about, 430 uh, species, this was morphological analysis by bloomers in the tropics uh, in Cameroon, 150, more than 150 species of mites under a few plants in the Kanza Tallgrass Prairie, I happen to know that because my graduate student, Mark St. John, said he would never do it for a dissertation. He would never, ever count that many mite species and identify them. And then, of course, the molecular techniques are just opening our eyes to what and how many types of organisms are in the soil. And as you all know, because this is a colleague of yours, Howard Ferris, has a, a beautiful food web of what happens with all these species. We still cram all these species into the various boxes in soil. What feeds on plant roots? What works on decomposing bacterial pathways of decomposition? Which ones are involved in fungal decomposition? A lot of pathways, and they all end up with the, the predators feeding them. So it's a food web below ground, but many, many, many different species in it. So when you take a soil sample and you look at something like this and you have to separate out mites and nematodes and other type of beast, uh, you wish, if you were going to study climate change, that you were doing it on another soil organism, this European mole. I mean, many times I've thought about, mm, maybe it's time to switch careers and go somewhere else and look at something bigger. But nematodes are pretty fascinating. I have to just give one slide for these. Um, these are ones we know the names of, and we know about 5% of the total, uh, what's estimated of species of nematodes worldwide. There's some in ocean sediments and marine sediments, I mean in um, freshwater lake sediments. But as you can see, these are pretty spectacular. Uh, we've got over here a, 
plant parasite with a stylet. These are bacterial feeders. They don't look anything alike, but we group them in one big box of bacterial feeders. I particularly like this species because it looks like a corn cob, got kind of left over. But the cool thing about them is they live in water films around soil particles. So if something happens to the water, that affects them. If there's a drought, desiccation, more water, it's going to affect them. But again, I want to just reemphasize that these, there are lots of species, but they are in high numbers usually in the soil. So this is also pretty intimidating. And this last quote here, uh, if all matter on Earth were swept away, we'd still see the shape of the Earth and where the mountains and oceans were. I can't tell you how many people have come up and you say, I study nematodes, and they said, oh, I remember back in biology when I was in high school, you know, somebody read me this thing. Is that true? Well, we don't know because we haven't looked at them all. So now let's get back to, this is kind of what I use as my organism. Let's get back to this climate change question again. So many years ago, when I was at UC Riverside, and I wanted to address some of these questions, and just starting with the distribution one, I thought naively that if I worked in desert soils, I would see fewer species. So I did 10 or 15 years worth of work in the hot deserts of the western US, this being my favorite site, looking at distribution out from the plant canopy and to depth. And what I was trying to get my handle on is, could I find a species that I can kind of track across the landscape, do some experiments on, and see how it would respond to climate change? What would happen? Well, we also have plants in the desert that have deep roots. And as you can see here, the roots go down to about 12 meters or so. At least that's how far we drilled. Uh, and everywhere there were roots, just about we would find nematodes. These are plant parasites. You notice they're not to species because we also had all the bacterial feeders and the fungal feeding nematodes and the predators, and it was hard to do. So basically, after about 10 years of work, I'm sitting there saying, oh my god, I haven't learned that much. I can't get to the species level and see what we could do experimentally was to see will we see any change with temperature, moisture, extreme events, whatever. What we did learn, though, was how they respond to this hot desert environment. And Don mentioned anhydrobiosis. John Crow here at UC Davis, I worked with him when he was here. Well, he's still around, I think, but I just couldn't see him today. But this is basically what happens. This is the active animal in a film of water. And as that film of water starts slowly to diminish, to decrease, the animal starts to lose its surface area and start to shrink and coil into this little Cheerio type animal. So the surface area is reduced, but that isn't all it's done. John Crow's lab showed that these animals change their biochemical pathway. They start to lose their water until they've lost about 99% of their water, and only about 1% bound to membrane stays. They also change their pathway to produce something that is more like an antifreeze, a triolose, some kind of protectant for those membranes. And in that state, they can be put under a vacuum, liquid nitrogen. You can do it in any stage of their life cycle. It can be adults or juveniles. It's not a dower type thing and put them on a shelf under a vacuum in your lab and come back and then pull them out and bring them back to life. So this was a pretty amazing thing for us. It was known for other nematodes, but we just hadn't seen it that much in, in soils and the environment. But because of this complexity, one of the days I was trying to, again, separate out what are the determinants of distribution of various species. I was at a meeting, actually it was a tropical organic matter meeting, and a colleague of mine from Stanford said, you ought to go somewhere where there's no plants to drive below ground diversity. And that's when I went to Antarctica. So I want to give you all uh, just a brief tour. This is uh, New Zealand. We fly there and fly to 77 South on a C-130. It's about an eight-hour flight. 
uh, not always pleasant. And sometimes we get about the point of no return and we just boomerang and go back to Christ Church and sit till they tell us we can fly again. A lot of people go to Antarctica about 64 south here from South America and that is usually by ship and I get seasick a lot. So, but it's a fabulous trip if you ever get a chance to see it. So why Antarctica besides that I decided to go there because it would have less species. Most people think that there is no land there, but about less than a half of the percent, well, maybe 2% of the whole place is ice free. And it's the fifth largest continent, that's big. The United States would fit in, in it very easily with space left over. It's got one of the most extreme climates on Earth, coldest, windiest. I'm sure I'm forgetting some, coldest, windiest, fill in the blanks. Uh, it can be pretty miserable. It's got a very low diversity. Our poster child is penguins more than polar bears. Uh, it's pristine relative to other places on Earth, but that also requires that to do science there, we have to be cognizant all, t all the time of what we are doing is affecting the ecosystem. Footprints stay for eons. Uh, it's type of experiments that I would want to do, like a transplant experiment or moving soil from one place to the other. You have to be very careful. Everything has to be approved by, by uh, the environmental. And it's not just because of that, it's also because nobody owns this continent. It's managed by the Antarctic Treaty for science. So we may have people from Korea or scientists from uh, New Zealand frequently working in the same area, or we may be talking with them as they come through McMurdo. But we're very cognizant that we have a responsibility to not destroy and break any aspect of the Antarctic Treaty. So what about the terrestrial systems? Well, the terrestrial systems are pretty unexplored. So let me just, the dark areas are where people have been, and they've looked at plants. Now, you notice I have plants in quotes. No vascular plants are we talking about right here. We're just going to talk about uh, dark areas where plants have been recorded. And one of these, I must admit, one of them is a grass and we've got invasive species, but I'm not talking about those. And then it's, all the rest of the area is places that have been visited, usually by geologists or um, ast uh, astronomers or someplace like that. And they haven't uh, picked up any samples or soils or whatever to bring back. So when we're talking about that, we're talking about bryophytes, mites, uh, bryophytes, lichens, mosses, uh, and some algae. Nevertheless, uh, a couple of years ago, we were able to distinguish, this is Alex Terod's work, that there are actually terrestrial areas for conservation this area here is headed to the South Pole, so this is around uh, southern Victoria land. And, whoops, sorry. Let's see if I can get this going here. That little red box is where I work, so I'll be talking mostly about that. But you can see there are a lot of coastal areas uh, where they're terrestrial places. There's two different, as you get towards uh, South America, you're seeing different kind of area, even within the Antarctic Peninsula. This is much warmer at 64 South. But now going into where I work is an area, all the, the brown is soil, all the area that's white is glaciers or ice. And what we have is just basically simple landscape. When Robert Falcon Scott came through the Dry Valleys in 1903, they came along this area right through here, and they were looking for their way to the South Pole, so they're dragging sledges. What's so cool about working in the Dry Valleys and in Antarctica is we've got the history of when human, humans first started coming in, 1903. So here he comes along the Taylor Glacier, and he looks down out to the Ross Sea. Over here is where McMurdo Station is, so we fly back and forth. He's looking into this area and saying, oh my God, I don't want to be here because you can't drive a sledge. He's gone the wrong way to go to the pole. But what is so interesting about it, and from my perspective, is these soils show the geology that was there. 
they not only show the geology and the mixture of geology and the, how many millions or thousands of years that we're seeing that are changing these soils as you go down valley, but they also were a lake 12,000 years ago. So much of the carbon that we see is legacy carbon into these soils. It's also interesting that the glaciers that you're seeing there just hang. The rates of sublimation and the, the reason this is such a dry valley, a hyper saline a kind of a hyper arid kind of a climate, is because the rates of sublimation are so high. We get very little snowfall at all in the dry valleys and you can see it disappear within seconds to hours as it hits the ground. So now let me get into a little bit more about kind of the, what we know about these valleys. These are the forms that you see. This lake that I'm showing here is Lake Frixel. Lake Frixel is about 20 meters deep. It's covered with ice about 12 uh, feet thick. And it stays, we walk across them if we can, and sometimes it has this moat that you see. About four to six months of the, four to six weeks of the year, the glaciers will get enough energy so the streams start to flow and you'll see the melt streams. And it's kind of like a whole ecosystem waiting for water. The algae are dried all winter long and they become active when the stream water flows. Then we've got the soils. And the soils, uh, this valley is about 18 miles long and it's our main site. And the soils are about 95% of this whole valley. So that kind of gives you the ecosystem. So what did Scott say when he got there? We've seen no living thing, not even a moss or a lichen. And I want you to picture this. This is not Moab, Moab Desert, where you can see cryptogamic crust all over the place. You don't see on the valley floor any lichens at all. It was, it's nothing. So the history, when I started working there, is kind of like this. Scott was there, and he called it the Valley of the Dead. He came back in 11, uh, 1911, I think 1913, his party came back. But there wasn't anybody else in the valleys for about 50 years into the International Geophysical Year. Then uh, there was a paper in Science Magazine in the late 60s by Horowitz that said the soils are essentially sterile there. Then there was uh, a couple of descriptions uh, in the 1970s of soil bacteria by Roy Cameron at Caltech and Father Tim working with David Viglierchio here in nematology. Uh, they described three species of nematodes. Then all of a sudden they found an ecosystem in rocks. Emory Friedman from Florida State. Microbes, algae, light coming through the rock, water coming through the rock, pretty spectacular finding all over the place. And then there was a description that we did that said that nematodes, tardigrades, and rotifers were there and they were restricted to water. That was the first time we went down. And then all of a sudden, we really wanted to find out if they're in these vast amount of dry soils. Remember, streams only flow four to six weeks. All the rest of these dry soils, were there any, was there anything there? Obviously there is, because I wouldn't be here. So now I'm gonna start talking about the research. I work with a long-term ecological research site. The first five years, Ross Virginia and I, when we first wrote the, the proposal, uh, and went to the Antarctic, it was from like 89 to 95, then we all got together with, and this is why this is here, we got together with geologists, glaciologists, so there were about 12 people on our team that we work with, geochemists, stream people, lake people, uh, and we formed the Dry Valley LTER. So now the questions of how cold does it get? This is the averages, I think, to 2012, and you can see that the surface temperatures get fairly high, but look at the soil temperatures. The absolute maximum can be higher than you would think. Uh, the average wind speed means you better put your tent on rocks or you can be blown away in it. But it's really surprising to people that we can get warm temperatures and a lot of energy into these soils. And then, it, of course, it can be also very, very, very cold. The fluctuations happen quick. So I don't want you to get the impression that when you see the absolute maximum or the absolute minimum here that that's, you know, a day or so. Because you can be standing in the field with three layers of clothes on and then, you know, pull, pulling them off 
and 10 minutes later putting them back on and be in total wind environment. They've used these areas as analogs to Mars for some time as an extreme cold area. And I just want to reemphasize again, remind you that it's dark down there a long time and these organisms have to have strategies. Otherwise, it's a pretty simple, similar desert to what, what I see in the southwest. Very carbon poor soils. There is some contemporary uh, carbon and that's in these cryptoendoliths that uh, this picture is and then in the lakes and the streams. And for a while we thought that that algae was blowing into the soils and being a source and it very well may be. We, we've documented it for a number of years. But just to give you an idea of what kind of activity we're talking about, here's a comparison of soil CO2 is a measure of kind of biotic activity, all the organisms breathing. And you can see that the Antarctic Dry Valley's down here are just almost off scale. But nevertheless, we, we measure it. I also want to give you an idea of scale, just so you can under appreciate sampling and what we're doing. This is the landscape, and that little red dot is a person in the landscape. So safety is also a big issue, and there's always two of us in the field wherever we go. So, so we do a lot of sampling, and as you can expect, um, the material does look like it's autoclave, but the trained eye, aided by a microscope, I really like this, sees otherwise. Uh, I, I thought this was really cool. That's because I like them. But who are the players? The invertebrates. We found about three species in these dry soils but only one had high numbers, and in many cases, we can see only that one species. We've got a single species of mite that occurs, that I didn't describe, I'm just saying that it's there. Single species of mite occurs in front of glaciers, and when they start to melt a little bit, you'll see this whole front, and we've got a columbolin. They are not widespread. This beast in the middle, the one that is Scott Nimalinzii, has numbers as high as the Hornada, the, the Chihuahuan Desert. It has a huge abundance and it is in a lot of soils. But there is a biogeographic pattern to this. These three lines, or these lines, show that in wet streams you have a greater abundance of organisms. And Scott Nima can occur, what I call Rambo. Scott Nima is really a tough nematode. It can occur in some of the driest soils and some of the saltiest soils, where you would never expect to see an organism. So I've pretty much already told you this, that it's an amazing beast, but why? Well, not only do we know that some of the physical, the niche, is defined by these physical properties because there's no plants to drive it, but the saline, where it is happy, is fairly saline, and when you compare it to Eudorolimus, the habitat is very distinctly a wet soil, and they very rarely co-occur. So we looked at both, there's another animal, Plectus, that's a bacterial feeder. Scott Nimmit is also a microbial feeder. Uh, Eudora limus, we found, eats algae. It doesn't seem to be a predator after we've looked at thousands and thousands of species. But we wanted to know what happens when water hits them and they're in soil. So we took some salty soil and we leached it one to one and we looked and we could see that Scott Nima, the blue line here, this is percent survival, becomes uh, active faster than Plectus in the lower graph. And here's what it looks like. This is when they rehydrate. This is when the water is added, they're this coil, and this is when they come out. So this is a Scott Nima reviving. Now it doesn't necessarily, it fills up with water first, but it may not have its metabolism firing in all direction. But we were able to do some predictions and find out that you can look at soil moisture going from wet to dry, and as you get drier and drier and drier, you get almost 100% of these nematodes coiled and inactive. So this is a mechanism of survival. We have, uh, as I said, we all work together, and one of my good colleagues is Byron Adams, and his students, uh, Bishwa Adekahari, did a study. 
And this one's going to take a little bit of explaining, but I want you to think about Scott Nema in its little water film being happy. So if it was just actively moving, it'd be at zero. Nothing would be, it's, it's just normally out in the soil film. Then all of a sudden, a cloud comes over. It starts getting dark like it's going into winter. It's desiccating. And all of a sudden, the heat shock proteins are affected. All this suite of genes are upregulated, and they have to do with these uh, antifreeze, things like triolose here is expressed. And then these other ones that have to do with pathways of protecting it. And it starts to go into anhydrobiosis. So for the long winter, it does turn on all these genes. And when it is just sitting out waiting for a cloud to go by and getting cooler and cooler, it can just turn on some normal um, antifreeze proteins. But the whole process of going into a long-term dehydration is all tied in to this anhydrobiosis. We've taken all this information about where do the different species occur. I'm not going to go into this slide a lot, but this is just a predictive model that we've done with some, something like 700 species, uh, 700 um, samples of salinity and all the soil chemistry information we can get to try to predict where would we see this over across a habitat. And we can come back to these questions about what do we need to know. Well, we know who the species are, right? So that's good. We know where it lives, because we can predict it with salinity. We can predict it with the amount of carbon. We know one species requires water, more carbon. Uh, how does it respond to its environment? We've got a pretty good handle on how it's going to respond to its environment. And furthermore, we've also found out that dispersal, when it's in that coil, is by wind. We've set up traps up and down the valley and been able to capture these nematodes in all species of them in these coils blowing around the valleys. What do they do in the ecosystem? I'll get to that, but what about climate change? So here's what's been going on. This was um, 82 to 2004, 2005. One area, the peninsula, Antarctic Peninsula, closest to um, South America, is one of the hottest places on the planet, warming up. But down here where we're working in the Trans-Antarctic Mountain Range, it was cooling. It was very strange. We saw in the valley the ice get thicker and thicker and thicker on the lakes, had less or shorter stream flows. And as we sampled over a period of years in our plots, we saw that Scott Nema populations were falling rapidly. So there was a significant decline during this period of time. We also were, we had uh, lots of experiments set up. We had these chambers. Anybody who works in the Arctic knows these ITEX chambers, International Tundra Experiment. They're also at NIWAT uh, LTR in Colorado. Small chambers melt water. You see that uh, they're warming the soils. And we also have snow fences. That's a very cheap way we could put up an experiment that wouldn't mess up the environment too much. And it collects more water on one side than it does on the other. And we could test a series of these up and down the valley to see what was happening. So we have warming events. But we also, after about 2005, started seeing something that we hadn't seen before. Instead of this nice cooling, all of a sudden what we're seeing was warming events. I mean, as in warming events where there were actually floods. This is a creek, now named Wormherder Creek, because I had a bunch of experiments there down in here that were warming experiments. The helicopter goes out, and the guy says, and the helicopter pilot says to me, hey, Diana, what's with this? You put your experiment in the middle of a stream? Why'd you do that? You don't study streams. Well, I looked out the window, I was floored, and it was ankle deep water never recorded in this area and people had been coming back and forth there forever. So we started seeing more events like this year to year to year, both warming events and also sunnier days. When we saw this rapid warming, here, here it is for the lake levels. So after all this cooling of 10 years, we've got a switch to warming. 
We've got so much water now in the lakes that we're having to move our camps further up the hill. The, the ice is getting thinner on those. The streams are running faster. So we're seeing these are periodic. They don't last all summer. We don't know when to expect them. But it's something that had not been recorded during the LTR or back to 1984. At the same time, there's an anomaly all around the continent. And the guys at the Palmer LTR are seeing major shifts in what's going on over there. So what we're seeing is a transition. After being sure we knew what was going on for 10 to 15 years, we're now seeing that we're getting And we're seeing Scott Nima that was kind of declining, is now kind of stabilizing here. A lot of this from one event, and Eudora Limus is maybe not totally shifting its population, but it looks like it's increasing, and the algae in the soil are increasing, and we've been following that. So does it matter that a single species responds in this dry environment? This is the who cares. And using stable isotopes, what we've been able to find is that about 7% of total carbon turnover is due to this one nematode species. So I guess what I would say is with a cooling climate, you could estimate over the period of time uh, that we saw this, this 12 years where we got a cooling climate, we would see a 30% reduction in soil carbon cycling and that reduction of a single species, the decline in a single species, could have an effect on this soil carbon cycling. So then the question comes back, well, if it's getting warmer again, how resilient are these animals going to be when they've got one habitat that they live in that's being disturbed with freeze-thaw changing in the system? We can also say that the McMurdo Dry Valley is no longer cooling on a decadal time scale. We're seeing lots more pulse events, and I've kind of haven't you given you all the data on how documented that is? The ecosystem responses we're seeing have ended their trend. And again, I'll go back. This had been documented, but just not by us since 1984 that these were cooling. Uh, also, Susan Solomon and Dave Thompson had predicted this for this area. We're seeing this also a landscape, and I'm thinking of the whole LTR here, or the whole valley. We're seeing landscape instability in terms of some of the permafrost is melting. We're seeing changes in longer time water in the system than we've seen before. They're just changing the soil habitat. So if we wanted to look at lessons from what we've done, just looking at this, and I want to go back, and I'm sure I've missed this, but there are no other animals taller or bigger or greater phyla. There's nothing else in the soil. There are no ants or earthworms or anything. It's nematodes, and if you don't like those, you can go study those little, that little mite up by the glaciers. So these are the dominant invertebrate across the valleys. So finding out that they, A, they're endemic to Antarctica, but the species that we do see are in different habitats defined by water, carbon, salts. We can make biogeographic predictions. And we've gone close to the pole in another grant uh, we went to 84 South to see if we could find and describe what was there. So what do they do? Whether or not this estimate that we have using Bill Hunt's model to estimate soil carbon turnover uh, is correct or not, looking at the decline, a single species can have a magnified effect on an ecosystem, or it may be highly vulnerable. And in this case, it, we expect it to be. Now, I haven't brought in a lot of things that are also, that's just kind of a summation of a lot of, lot of papers and work by a lot of people that I admire and I'm glad I get to work with. But I just kind of like to bring you back to what's happening now. And I mentioned that nobody owns Antarctica. I would also mention that a number of nations have claims on it. The US does not have a claim, but we have the biggest geopolitical footprint there. We have three big stations but other countries are fast building stations because they see melt. And they see that they can get to some of those resources under the ice, some of these minerals. 
But perhaps one of the biggest ones, besides climate change, which we've got documented here, and which we wrote an article to get the Antarctic Treaty to move faster on, is invasive species. So this is the number of visitors landing, these big circles. So you can just look at the, where people go here, mostly around the coast, a lot up near Palmer Peninsula. It's spectacular up there, and you can see why. But we see that not only are the scientists at fault, and we have to be more careful about bringing invasive species in. We've got a lot of people, like my colleague Ross Virginia, works in the Arctic in the summer, the real our summer, and goes south in the winter. And sometimes he brings his own gear. The Australians have already said, no more Velcro, not carrying any seeds. We wash our feet when we get on and off ships. Uh, there's a lot. We're talking about doing that now on the C-130s and watching what we take with us. It's a real concern because these species are not many, and we have no idea what's going to happen, but we can see what is starting to happen at Palmer Peninsula. So that's one big issue. Climate change is obviously the biggest issue we've got, and I won't go into all that. Uh, there's a paper in Nature not too long ago called about horizons and the priorities for Antarctica research. And it was the first time I've ever seen the geologist and the ice core people and the lake, hidden lake people all packed in a room like this and agreeing on six priorities for research. We see this continent changing and we're concerned. So now I want to get back to do these lessons um, from this place apply anywhere else. And I'd just like to just real quickly, if I've got about five, I've got 10, okay, good. Eight, okay. <laughs> Make sure I get that last minute. Okay, do these apply anywhere else? And this is when my world is looking at the way the world should be. You're looking at soil and that tree is hanging down below. I think that's a pretty cool way to think about the world. Um, I think we've got a lot of real promise in what's happening in soil ecology and soil biodiversity and thinking about plants above ground. And I just want to kind of rapidly go through. We're going to know who some of these things are in the soil much faster than we ever believed we would. Uh, we've got sequencing. Um, this is a study on accelerating knowledge of all soil animals. So it's everything from tardigrades, I think, all the way up to annelids. Uh, sure, it's a broad cut, but they have down at the bottom saying we have said something about most soil animals were endemic. We just recently did one in Central Park. Uh, that was both archaea, bacteria, all the way through to soil animals, just looking at the soil biodiversity there. Uh, we're looking at moisture across gradients, large-scale gradients. What is a nematode response in arid environments? Does the stuff in Antarctica mean anything? And basically, you get to, uh, as you um, look at soil moisture and increase it, the nematode abundance and uh, types of trophy groups build to a certain point and then stay pretty stable. Abiotic controls on bacteria. Noah Ferrer's paper said that you can look at samples north of South America, and pH was the main driver of the, the uh, bacterial type of diversity. Metagenomics, we're seeing that this is a little, just look at this line right here, and it separates out all the forest from prairies and tundra over here in terms of what they do versus over here, and this is deserts. Cold desert, hot desert are very similar. And you can see that deserts, the genes that they were looking at for upregulation or the, uh, in their sequence here, are all having to do with survival compared to breaking down heavy organic matter. So I think the techniques, all I'm saying is these may not be the right papers, but I think we're going to see these advances on who's there and what are they doing more and more. The other thing that's happening is global networks of experiments, volunteers, this global connectivity. And so I'm just using an example of mine, but there's many, many more. I just heard one today. Um, volunteering to find out, do soil animals matter or do they not? So let's keep them out of some litter bags and let's let them go into some litter bags and then let's see if the decay rates are the same. And the red map shows where soil animals were important. But if you did it on a global scale, like an economic, the World Economic Index, they didn't look like they were very important. So they're important in some regional places. We're seeing analyses, like this analysis that we did that was in Ecology Letters, where we just took all the data we could find and said, do soil fauna, what does the data show the way we're looking at it? 
And then I also want to go to the soil food web. I'm not saying that everything has to be by species level. Uh, this is an example of a paper by Francesca De Vries and a whole bunch of people that say soil food web properties are explaining ecosystem services across European land use systems. And I thought it was really interesting that they were brave enough to say at the end, our quantification of all the soil organisms they looked at, and they looked at a lot, uh, shows that soil biota need to be included in carbon and nitrogen cycling models. And they went so far as to say, and considered in conservation. So in other words, when we're doing the Serengeti National Park, is that conserving the right biodiversity below ground? Have we looked at that, or do we just assume everywhere? So the Europeans have taken this a step forward, a further. Uh, their contribution, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the European Commission put together this European Atlas of Soil Biodiversity. And here they've ranked no threats to th such things as disappearing carbon, decline of carbon, uh, land management, invasive species. And they've ranked, you can go through and see, by soil biotic group. The other thing I would say is that just looking at kind of routine data, looking at this is the British Ecological Journals and what has happened with them since 1995. I haven't got all the data yet for 2014, but you can see the increase in the terminology of just using soil biodiversity. This one was picked in particular because it used to be heavily plant dominated, only above ground vegetation. So all this comes to the fact that more recently we have established a global soil biodiversity initiative. And it, it is a scientific agenda and mostly to inform people and to try to bring case studies together. And it was suggested by the European Commission that we do this. It's based with me. I can tell you about the amount of work later because I didn't think it would be but me and a few of my friends and it turns out that uh, we also said we would have a, a uh, first global soil biodiversity conference in Dijon in December, and we just closed the registration with 675 people, because uh, that's all the seats we've got. But the amount of young people coming to this because they are interested in not only the climate change, the land use, the various factors that the European Commission is looking at, has been astounding, and we've gotten great support for this. I think a lot of it is the techniques, the analyses, the types of tools we've got to answer these questions now and put it on GIS maps and say, where do we see vulnerability for climate change? So with that, I would like to thank the Worm Herder team, uh, all the soil, lakes, and stream teams, and everybody else. Thanks. Questions? Yeah, Louise. Well, the description of the ability of these nematodes to shrivel up and survive and how old they are. That's what we, we, we yes, that's what we looked at because I, I've, I may have never looked at it before and some of these nematologists can tell me if I'm crazy or not, but um, I had never seen that many living, well, how, how do you say it, carcasses. They're carcasses in the soil samples. They just sit there. You know, we'll see. So we count uh, for every sample dead, living, adults, juveniles, males, females, whatever data we can gather off every single sample. And we have, we sent some samples to be carbon dated. That takes a lot of picking of, of these. And uh, we sent some masses. And the numbers were just way off scale. And so we, it's not reliable. And so we just never went back to it. Another question. Hello? <laughs> yeah. Um, when you have this decline in Scandinavia, in the US, the immense systems, there is somebody that compensate for that. Mm -hmm. But are these the, so the last guys in that totem pole? Yeah. And, and would you answer that change if you thought about microbes? Oh, yeah, we've now got, I mean, we didn't when we went there, and I, I you know, I, I gave that preamble about the history of it so you could see that we just kind of landed on Mars and nobody had looked except in those melt streams, and we thought we'd have a one-year grant. Honest to God, we thought we'd be back home and 
and uh, we wouldn't find anything, and it was a great adventure. When we started finding that the majority of the soil, so I didn't give you a figure here, that in these soils across this valley, and I'm saying 700 or something, 40% um, of them have no, no invertebrates whatsoever. So we were able to then take, what are those soils? Why don't they have any? What are their characteristics? And why are these good habitats over here? Then only 30% of the soils that we see uh, have this eudorolimus, the water, and plectus. All the rest of them have single invertebrate species, Scott Nemo. So when it declines, there's nothing there. Now, if the soils get wetter, we expect to see Eudorolimus and Plectus move into those soils as they leach out the salts. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you mean like it's just a normal dry, right. are they moving? So the guys that left Scott. the dry is out. Oh, okay. Stop, stop all yeah, yeah. If they're in anhydrobiosis, they're not breathing, or they're just decoupled from the whole carbon cycling. They're just sitting there. I don't know lungfish, so. <laughs> well, when they dry out, yeah, it, it, it dry out, and then the heat rehydrates them. Yeah, and it's like algae. We've got algae there that we, they just look like trash and not metabolizing and you add water and man, they just go off. They've only got a short time to do it, so they move fast. They, they do their, but they don't, um, we did a lab experiment where we looked at the life cycle of Scott Nema and it's about a hundred, I can't remember exactly, but somewhere like 180 days. Well, that takes several years to get to if you're going from egg to egg. And we just cranked it up in the laboratory laboratory to a higher temperature to see. And it took us several months to get that far. Mm -hmm. So you talked about uh, the potential for invasive plants. Is there any sense of what extent there could be new invasive soil biota? Could they come in sort of before the plants or after the plants? Or what would be the consequences? We haven't looked at that. The last study I saw, and, and you know, this is again one of the problems because I haven't talked to my Antarctic colleagues who are from other countries that are doing work there, and they may know something, you know, that they haven't published yet, but there was one publication just like coming out of, um, so we've got kind of a hut there that we can be in out of the field, and we live in the tents, but we can eat in there, and so somebody took soil samples and looked at fungi as you get further and further from the door, and they were all our kind, so they were, they were not, but a guy named Bob Blanchett, who's a plant pathologist at Minnesota, had, they, he and Roberta Farrell have been looking at the old huts. So the old huts where Scott, you can just see everything as they left it. I mean, their beer cans, you know, whiskey bottles, everything is just like they left it. But the building was starting to come down and they thought maybe it was decaying because of the salt water. They're, they're usually put their huts right near so they could walk across the ice. And what they found out, the question was, when they found out there were fungi there, oh, wow, did they bring them with them when they brought the wood for the huts, or are they indigenous? And it turns out those fungi that are decaying that hut are from there. They were not brought from Britain or Christchurch, wherever they landed. So it doesn't answer your question, and I don't know, but I would suspect that we're bringing in lots of microbes and stuff from other places would be my first first thought, and that I think um, they're so worried now about invasive species getting to the further south from, I mean, it's much easier to get there from our Chile and Argentina. Yeah, well, there's, there's a couple of things there. I mean, the biggest feedback, um, it's going to, I mean, the models are predicting it's going to, I mean, I can't tell you the number of people who have told me, oh, you're never going to see the Arctic meltdown. And we, you know, <laughs> that, that's happening and we're expecting it's the, the latest is the rate, the, the rate of increase in temperature in Antarctica, particularly for the West Antarctic ice sheet, I think, is higher than was predicted. It's happening fa faster than the model said it would. So now getting back to your question about the carbon cycling and the feedbacks, we know that there's gonna be a lot of other things that may affect that rather than 
you know, putting the biota into this whole picture. One of them is if it gets w wetter, we're going to see more algae. Does that mean that more algae are going to keep the soil stable? Because right now the top two centimeters do not have, it's kind of converse, you don't see the most nematodes in that top little layer. It's blown like crazy all the time. It's abraded. We see them below that down to permafrost. The permafrost, however, is very close. So if we start seeing that permafrost plus, plus some water, we're going to see that it's going to be darker, it's going to absorb more light, it's going to be warmer, then we might see that feedback. We're going to see more Eudora limus. I don't know what's going to happen then. Mm -hmm. um, just going off what you just said, how, have you done, so you, you showed the research looking at, in the hot desert, the depth of these nematodes. So have you looked at how deep you find these uh, anti antihydrous? and hydrous no, no. Mm -mm. no, it's it's really tricky getting them out of soil. We have a technique, it's just a high molecular um, sugar and that'll keep them in there. It's, it's not a sugar, but it's like a high molecular sugar and it'll keep them in their antihydrobiotic state. But then you've got to count them and pick them that way and keep them in that and not let them get in any water. So we haven't gone any further than that. We've got a technique where we go out, take the solution in soil and kind of a plastic jug, sample the soil, put the lid on it, it's already in that material, mix it really fast, and then everything else from there has to be processed in a high, high uh, density. Mm -hmm. You mentioned one of your study sites or places you're looking at was a lake, and I assume that was during the best in a glacial period. Well, the, the lakes are, I'm not really looking at them. It's a lake. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 Lake Washburn. Lake Washburn was an interglacial, yeah. It's 12,000 years ago, it's yeah. What was the ecosystem like back then? Well, we can see the bathtub ring of where the lake level was, and uh, it was warmer for sure, but our lake is rising now and it's still cold, and a lot of it is due because we're seeing a higher increase in energy input into the system. Lots of sunny days, lots and lots and lots of sunny days, but it's not necessarily warmer. The temperature's cold. We're just getting a lot more energy, which is heating up that whole system. So we're getting lake levels are getting thinner. We're seeing more water rush in. We've moved camps. NSF has moved camps considerably since I've been there. And I don't know, it wasn't tropical, I guess is what I'm trying to say, when Lake Washburn was there. It was a cold lake, and it may have been ice covered in winters, but I don't know. Is there any vegetation? There, the algae, um, there are huge mats under these lakes. And we think they were still, this is remnants of what was there then, so kind of like paleo mats. They are very tall, like, I don't know which one is stromatolites or the one that comes from the bottom up. Um, and stalagmites. which ones? Stalagmites. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and so they study these and they measure how much they are, but we also study how much sediment is blown onto lakes and onto the glaciers. So we know uh, the glaciers also have life in them and microbes in them and rotifers in them. And the dust from the soil blows on those glaciers. It blows onto the lake. You have sediment dumps into the soil. And on the lake edges, those, those um, I'll just call them mats, <laughs> those algal mats are, come out. And you can see them when the moat is present. And then they blow dried around the valley and become carbon sources also. But all the mats and the algae that was there and you can look across there and you can see the difference in the line where that lake was 12,000 years ago. And the, the stable isotope signatures below that line and above that line are very, very different. So we get two different sources of carbon. Melting in the, in the Arctic, that's starting to decompose and, and produce greenhouse gases. Right. I bet that could be going on in the Antarctic. Well, when there's a big difference. We don't have the organic matter capacity that they have, so we don't have nearly that. And our permafrost is much shorter compared to the, the Arctic system permafrost. 
at the moment Byron Adams is. And I will ask him that question, and I could tell you what he says. He's a molecular evolutionary nematologist, and so he knows a lot more about it than I do. Mm -hmm.